the biblical truth of our hymns, Blessed Redeemer. This would be number 43 that we have on the YouTube. So, written by Avis Margarita, Margarite Bergeson Christensen. Uh, must tell you that, first of all, this hymn is copyrighted the following year and the first appeared in the Songs of Redemption, compiled in 1921 by W. Pluckett Martin and James W. Jokes, and published by the Baptist Home Mission Board in Atlanta, Georgia. The copyright was later assigned to Singspiration Music, and after its renewal in 1949, was owned by John T. Benson, Jr. And under the 17th Code of 107, Limited Rights of Fair Use, we are using this for education. We are using this to improve ourselves in our Christian walk. The biblical truth of our hymns, this one is a good hymn, is that are these hymns good for churches to sing, Christian? <coughs> Bible-believing, Christ-centered, Christ-honoring, Bible-obeying obe Christians. Are these hymns, are they good? This one is a good one, but this one's copyrighted. And outside the, the, the real thing, outside Blessed Redeemer, when, in our church, when they sing, you know, sing 486, 123, number 8, number... And when I see the hymns that have copyrights, why? Why not just keep your work out there for free? The King James Bible has never been copyrighted. There's no royalty. And I'm just saying that because here is a copyright one, and we've dealt with copyright issues before. So... She attended the Moody Church, pastored for many years by Dr. Harry Ironside. You probably heard his name. She was a modest and retiring woman and sometimes used pen names as Avis Bergeson, Christian B. Anson, and Constance B. Reed. Now, the, the music to this also Harry Dixon Lowe's. That's another name, not given to the birth name. I've got my own family. They're, they're born with this name, but they give another name. I mean, there have been many times the word styly, my name, is my, that's the name I was given. I don't know why I would change it, but I'm making a lot of personal comments, my own little commentary here, and my own little opinions, and don't need to do anything. She died in 1985. Um, not too long ago. So we have up Calvary's mountain. In Luke 23, 33, when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. Matthew 27, 33, when they were come up to the place called Golgotha, that is to say the place of a skull. A skull. A head, the bones of the head without any meat. And many, many say that that's what that hill looked like. That's how it got the name. So if you're going to call yourself, I mean, Calvary is where Jesus Christ suffered and died, but it means skull. Skull Baptist Church. And skull represents death. It's one of them honored tattoos. It's a symbol of pirates. Though a skull is not the symbol of the gospel that Jesus Christ suffered and died according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, but that's where he suffered and died upon Calvary, upon uh, Golgotha, upon the skull, upon a cross. And yet the cross is not the emblem of our salvation, the blood. One dreadful morn, walk Christ my Savior, Paul tells us that there's another Jesus. There's another gospel. And we got to be careful. There's another spirit. Christ means anointed one. When the church goes away, there is coming that Antichrist. He's not Jesus Christ. He's not God's Christ. Christ means anointed one. When John writes his, uh, his epistles, I believe it's the second epistle, he mentions there are many antichrists or the first epistle. 
There are antichrists running around right now. They are not the Christ. They're both come and gone and died. They're living now and they will come again. But you must have Christ, the one that is virgin born, the one that is born of Judah, the one that is sealed, the one that is anointed by God alone and not to have a false Christ. You can't have a Christ that's not God. And you can't have a Christ that you can eat and drink. You gotta have Christ, my Savior. There's only one that saves. There's only one that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Weary and worn. That's, a, that's an understatement. When we read what the Bible that Jesus Christ is suffering, the brutality, the beatings, the, the face hairs being pulled, being punched, being spitted upon, the crown of thorns, when men of strength and men of power this belted the Lord Jesus Christ with all their might. You realize from the time that he went in that garden and prayed three times that Peter, James, and John slept. He had to wake them up three times. And they had just come from the dinner, the, the Lord, the, the, I mean the Last Supper, and they were singing after the supper and they'd gone to the to the to the garden and he prayed it's not recorded the last time when Jesus Christ slept before this time he's in the garden he finishes praying three times he had to wake up the disciples three times Judas come and they carry him off to the Sanhedrin to the high priest in the middle of the night they had this trial that was illegal and they're punching him, and they're beating him, they're whipping him. And early in the morning, they head him off to Pilate with no sleep. And he stands all day before Pilate, and before Herod, before the children of Israel. And tired, and worn out, and beaded, and bleeding, and suffering, and pain, and sorrow. He carries that cross up that hill, up that mountain. Facing for sinners, death on the cross. He came on to he, he came to save the lost. He came to save us sinners. He came and was brutally treated. That God may not send my hell, uh, send my soul into hell for all eternity. I am not going to suffer because of Jesus Christ. I am not going to be tormented in the flames because of what Jesus Christ suffered and died for me. That he might save them from endless loss. Now this is a wonderful, wonderful hymn. But imagine 100% of your body, third degree burns for all eternity and no medicine, no relief, no sleeping, no lying down, no sitting down. The swimming, it's a lake of fire and you're swimming, go jump in the lake. The Bible speaks about hell and that rich man being tormented in torments. The agony of hell, that's, that's it. See, hell is going to release, death and hell are going to release in Revelation 20. And they're going to stand before God, prepare to meet thy God, God, the Bible says. But once they go off in the lake of fire that burneth forever, there is no more relief. There is no, I don't know when they stand before God, I don't know if they're in torments. Coming out of death and hell. I don't know how they are, but when God declared to them depart from me workers of iniquity I never knew you and you are thrown to the lake of fire you are never ever ever coming out and the torments I used to preach when I was in prison I used to preach that this picture and this is just an illustration it's not true but picture a clock in hell and The fact is, that clock on the wall, and it has no hands. Picture a time where there will be no time. Picture 
agony of torment, of extreme pain, of pain that you will never ever, and I don't think any human but Jesus Christ has ever suffered. And there is no relief. Christ did not get no relief on that cross. He said, I thirst, and they gave him vinegar. God allowed a human, the creation that he created, to, that people don't like this, but to beat the hell out of Jesus. I mean, if he suffered and died, I may not go to hell. The creator that made us told the creation, go ahead and do what you will. And one of the Gospels even says, far, I forget which one, it says this unmentionable things they've done to Jesus. I can't even imagine. So I don't go to hell. So that I can preach Saturday morning to residents of this area, to visitors of this area, to tourists of this area, to people going to, to buy goods here, that they might hear the loving grace and the love of God through Jesus Christ. I'll do the reframe afterwards. Father, forgive them. The Gospel of Luke records. Now remember, it began with Judas coming, giving him a kiss. But before that, there are three of his important disciples, Peter, James, and John. The angels came down and ministered him. Peter, James, and John missed it. So the rejection of Jesus going to the cross began at that garden. And here comes a group of men with torches, with staves. You know what the staves were used in the Old Testament? They were used to carry the ark. They were used to carry the table. They were used to carry the altar and incense. They were used to carry the, the brazen altar. And when God is manifesting the flesh and praying to God the Father about that cup of sins, they are carrying the, the items that were used, not the very ones, but I'm just saying staves, staves that were to carry the instruments of the tabernacle through the wilderness. Coming to get God, Jesus Christ. And when the reaction of God manifests in the flesh, Jesus Christ is, I'm going to call 1-800-LAWYERS, whatever. I'm going to get revenge. I'm going to call one angel that can destroy a whole army. I'm going to call upon ten legions of angels. I'm going to call all the angels in heaven. I'm going to say, God, cast down your fire. Burn these people up. God, I'm going to ask you to give them incurable diseases. No. Christ on the cross, God said, Father, forgive them. Thus did he pray. I don't think I would be that lenient as a born-again Bible-believing Christian that tries to tell lost people about Jesus Christ, trying to grow Christians up in the Lord. I, I really don't know. If I were to be taken right now, taken any time, and... and, and Take it to a place where I'd be beaten, where I'd be tortured for the name of Jesus Christ by whoever, whatever. In the flesh. I don't know what I would do or say. Even while his lifeblood flowed fast away. While he's bleeding God's blood, Acts 20, 28. Father, forgive him. All right, snake eyes gets the robe. Oh, you got the short straw. I guess you get his sandals. <laughs> come on down. Let's see if God will come again. Come on. Hey, he wants some water. Give me that vinegar. <laughs> Father, forgive them. Eighteen years I live without being saved. 18 years until I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. All the wickedness, all the violence, you wouldn't even want to know. April 25th, 1987. 
I knelt down in the afternoon at one time. Jesus Christ turned to the Father and said, Father, Stiley Hayward, Father, forgive them. Write his name down in the Lamb's Book of Life in my blood. Father, he's now a child of God. Father, send him the Holy Spirit. Father, he's got reservations to come into glory. Because he has believed on me. He has trusted in me. And he came to me with nothing, nothing, nothing. Just as a sinner repenting. A man seeking a party. Father, yes. Stiley Hayward, yes. Forgive him. And anybody else who's called upon him. Father, forgive them. Of God's blood. Praying for sinners. While in such woe, while he's in woe, while he is suffering, while he is gagging internally of the crucifixion. He's looking out for mankind. John, yes. My mother, yes. Take her. Mary, yes. John, go with him. Two dying thieves. Ah, look at you. Ah, look, at you. look how great you are. Ah. And then one says, Jesus, yes, I'm guilty. You thief over there, you shut up. I'm guilty, Jesus. When you come into your kingdom, and Jesus told that dying thief that repented and got right without baptism, without church attendance, without any works, Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. From a man whose blood is draining out of him, who, whose man whose bodily fluids are, are drowning him inside. And he says, Father, forgive them. I'll see you today. No one but Jesus. Hey, 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 look at that. This is one of them few hymns that have the name Jesus. Ever so loved. Uh, ever loved so. We love him because he first loved us. He loved me before I even knew who he was. He died approximately 33 and a half AD. Let's say 33 AD. It would make them a round number. He died. Nine, uh, he died 1,935 years. I think my math is correct. I was born in 1968. Long before. And let's not count the 18 years I lived in the world, 1987. Before I was born, he suffered and died for me. While I lived in the world 18 years, he still suffered and died for me. And he still reached out to me. Now I love him. Because he first loved me. Jesus Christ, Savior. Oh, how I love him. I do, but not all the time. I get in the flesh. I get into sin. I get angry. I sin. I get impatient. I sin. But I love him. Savior. How am I? If somebody comes to me and say, how are you going to heaven? You going to heaven? Yes. How are you getting there? Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ. And nothing else. You're not going to hell, you say? That's correct. Why? Savior. Jesus. Burning candles? Nope, that don't work. Paying somebody? That don't work. Burning sins in purgatory? There is no purgatory. My all in all rests upon the all of Savior, Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, and who is God, who suffered and died upon Calvary's hill. And friend, what a friend. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I've had many times in my life this internal battle inside me of the flesh versus the spirit and the spirit versus the flesh. In the Bible, Paul writes that they are enmity with each other. They hate each other. And when this flesh is just wild and wicked and sinner, 
The Holy Spirit just sits and says, just calm down. Just relax. In Pilgrim's Progress, he comes to a room and there's, there's two children sitting there. One's just sitting there all calm and cool. The other one, man, he want, he's running all over the place. He, I mean, he, he's like a kid in the toy store and he's like a kid crying because he can't get the candy at the candy store. And then they give that child the impatient one, they give him everything he wanted. And the one that sits in the chair that's patient just sits there like smiles. He got all his rewards. Oh, the rewards I'm going to get later. Oh, trials and tribulations of this earth and this planet and this world. I want to get off. I want to go home. Just wait. Maybe today I'll do something that will bless the angels to rejoice as a sinner coming home. Maybe I'll do something that a saved man will grow. Maybe I'll encourage somebody. I did not die last night. I did not die this morning. I'm not dead yet because God's not finished with me. What a friend. In trouble, child. I know that. I know that. How can my praises ever find in? I'll tell you how. When we go to eternal life and go before New Jerusalem, we're standing before that throne forever, before God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, before the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. There they are forever. We're going to praise them, and there is no end. You see, when we get to glory, there's no clocks. There's no calendars. There's no smartphones. There's no months. There's no years. There's no days. There's no seconds. There's no microseconds. Time will have no end. As for the man that's in the lake of fire forever, and as the man that is before Jesus Christ in New Jerusalem, God will give us an eternal, never ending to worship and praise his son and his son alone. Glory and honor to Jesus Christ. Though years unnumbered on heaven's shore, and you can't even say that, because there are no years. 10,000 years, Amazing Grace said. No, there are no years in, in the kingdom. There is no more years in New Jerusalem. There are no more years in the new earth. There are no more years in the new heavens. There are no more years in the lake of fire. Time has stopped before Revelation 20. There will be no tomorrow and there will be no yesterday. It's always now. God will be I am. And we will be I are. My tongue shall praise him forevermore. We're not going to get there. We're not going to sing about the church. How great our Baptist church was. How great our pastor was. How great we were as a church. How great Christian I am. We're not going to heaven to sing how great I am. We're going to go to glory before Jesus Christ and sing how great thou art. There's a big difference between how great thou art and how great I am. And it's not going to be about us because not of works least any man boasts. It's going to be all about Jesus Christ. Blessed. You know that means happy. When Leah gives birth to, I believe it's Asher, all the women are going to be happy. All the women are going to be pleased. Happy. I'll call him Asher. Blessed. Redeemer. He bought me back. I was of God through Adam. Genesis 2. Fell into sin, Genesis 3. A father, my devil, a liar, a murderer, John 8, 44. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, receiving salvation by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, receiving Christ alone and nothing else for my salvation. 
I have been adopted. I have my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I have been redeemed by Jesus Christ by shedding his blood, by dying on that cross, and nothing, nothing else can do. That is my Redeemer. God purchased me, Acts 20, 28, with God's blood, and that blood of God flowed through Jesus Christ. Precious Redeemer. There is no, nothing I could buy. There is nothing I could equal. There is nothing of value ever. In the worlds of past, the worlds today, and the worlds of the future, nothing could be equal and match to Jesus Christ. Seems now I see him on Calvary's tree. Keep going back to that tree. Keep on going back to Calvary. Keep on reminding yourself. One of the churches God wrote to Jesus Christ said you lost your first love. Get back to Bethel, Jacob. Get back where you first met God. Get back that love. Get back that care. Get back that heart. Get back that spirit. Get back to where God said. You are a sinner. You are only a sinner. And if you don't receive Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. Yes, Lord God, I believe. Glory to God. That cleansing, that, that, that I remember still that, that, that gooeyness inside me, I got saved. Wounded and bleeding. You know, we got this wounded for warriors. And nothing wrong with that. Our soldiers are wounded. But there's a soldier that's wounded above all wounds. And he was a sinless savior. He's a sinless God. He did not deserve anything he received from the time of that last supper unto the burial. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. I find in no fault in him. Wow, he's laying his hands down for the nail. He laid his other hand down for the nail. Man, this guy ain't fighting us. In agony. Turns to, to his mother with John. In agony, turns to the repentant thief. In agony, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Wounded and bleeding for sinners. That's it. Pleading. Blind and unheeding. I can't tell you how long I've been in a public ministry. If I was holding signs, if I was giving out gospel tracts, it involves talking to people, it involves preaching, all kinds of, uh, of public ministry from Connecticut down to Florida, where I live in Daytona Beach. I can't tell you the countless people who just moved on. Shut up. Don't want to hear that. We should go away. You're aggravating us. You're going to ruin our business. We don't want you. We don't want that. And yet there are people who, oh, thank you for doing this. Thank you very much. Encourage me. Keep going. Keep doing it. Keep up the work. Keep on serving the Lord. Do right. If there's one thing about the public ministry that I know, I'm out there preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because I received the gospel of Jesus Christ. I preach Jesus saves because he saved me. I preach the blood of Jesus Christ because there's nothing else that washed away my sins. Blessed Redeemer has a copyright on it. That's okay. Put it in your hymnal. Put it in your heart. Remember Calvary. Remember. 